This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Jennifer Burney is an assistant professor in the School of Global Policy and Strategy. Her work focuses on the relationships between climate and food security. Using global data as well as smaller scale studies of innovative technologies and strategies, tonight she will explore the potential for a resilient food system at the heart of a new sustainable development agenda. Professor Burney was named a National Geographic Emerging Explorer in 2011. Thank you, it's such an honor to be here tonight, especially among colleagues uh, whom I deeply, deeply admire. We live in a world where nearly a billion people simply do not have enough food to eat on a daily basis. And an even greater number suffer from so-called hidden hunger or a critical lack of protein and micronutrients. This reality should pain us. And I believe we have a moral imperative to at least think about how to address it. But I'd be lying if I said it isn't daunting. Because the world I want us to imagine tonight is one in which everyone has enough food to eat at all times. That is food security, and that is a tall order. To get there, to do some radical rethinking, as this talk title suggests, I'd like to start by suggesting that we need to consider the broader ecosystem, because food is neither produced nor consumed in a vacuum. Aha. <laughs> My research focuses on the relationships between food security and climate, and these two issues are, of course, deeply intertwined. On the one hand, climate changes impact agricultural production. On the other hand, food production, processing, and consumption are major contributors to climate change. From our perspective here in California, one of the world's leading economies and agricultural epicenters, it's easy to look at this set of coupled problems to see only the potentially vicious cycle and to conclude that the answer here is actually to produce less food. In fact, I hear this all the time, that globally we produce more than enough calories to feed everyone and so should thus ratchet back production in the name of sustainability. But here's the thing, even if that factoid about calories is technically correct, this view rests on a cartoonish notion that the world food supply is some sort of self-replenishing pile and that it's simply a matter of will to get that food into everyone's bowls. I want to dispense with that myth tonight because of course the world does not work this way. The world food economy is comprised of hundreds of millions of farmers and billions of consumers. Sometimes the interactions between producers and consumers are direct like you see here, but most often there are intermediaries involved. And every year, those hundreds of millions of farmers are making decisions about what to produce, how to produce it, and what to do with that production based largely on two things, economic signals and environmental expectations. So food security is not some centralized distribution problem. The world food economy is a dynamic, complex system that's deeply coupled to the environment and that quite literally involves every single person on the planet. So the first thing I'd like to say tonight is that if we want to think about making our world a more food secure place, we need to engage with this system. The second thing I'd like to suggest is that the best way to do so is to focus on smallholders or family farmers. Why? Let's look at some numbers. There are roughly 600 million farms worldwide. Of these, around 500 million are family farms owned and operated by households, not agribusinesses. Most of these are fairly small, from less than an acre to a few dozen acres. And especially when you consider production from these small family farms worldwide, most food doesn't actually travel that far between where it is produced and where it is consumed. Often a lot of it is eaten at home or traded or sold in nearby markets. Uh, yet even though many of these family farms rely on their own production for their food, they are often not self-sufficient and are counterintuitively net food consumers. Finally, most of the world's poorest, most food insecure households are in fact farmers. So raising the productivity of small family farms is key for global food security. And these farms are feeling the pressures of climate change. 
With the rest of my time tonight, I want to introduce you to three ways in which thinking about alleviating the constraints that climate places on smallholder farmers can actually offer hope for both a more food secure and climate stable world. Okay, so the first way that climate impacts smallholders is through seasonality. Many of the world's poor family farmers grow rain-fed crops and live in monsoonal ecosystems where all the rain and thus all of the agricultural production is confined to one part of the year. This, for example, is a cropping calendar for Niger. In rural areas that are not well connected to markets, um, this creates what is known as the hungry season as households try to stretch their food stores through to the next harvest. During this time of year, they may have to eat less food or buy food at much higher prices. And as a result, when harvest time finally does come around, they are often desperate to sell their crops, but this is when prices are lowest. There are lots of ways to think about breaking this cycle, and a number of colleagues here at UC San Diego are working on this, but my own work in this domain focuses on irrigation. I've been working with the Solar Electric Light Fund to help women's farming groups in Benin, West Africa, use solar-powered drip irrigation systems to grow fruits and vegetables during the long dry season. These systems use photovoltaic arrays, like the one you see here, to sustainably pump groundwater into large reservoirs, like you see on the lower left here. Water is then gravity distributed through conventional drip irrigation systems, like you see in this field that's being prepared. These are community scale gardens that are now owned and operated by women's farming groups in 10 rural villages in northern Benin. Uh, and we've seen that these farmers and their families, thousands of direct beneficiaries, reap both significant income and nutritional benefits from being able to produce, consume, and sell food year round. So here we have a strategy that is profitable that helps farmers adapt to climate by breaking the seasonal rainfall dependence, and that also mitigates climate change. Because by using a renewable energy source, instead of gas or diesel-based alternatives, these gardens each offset about a ton of carbon per year. The second way in which climate changes are impacting food production is through longer run trends. I think we are all aware that average global temperatures are now the hottest on record. We also now know, although it varies by crop and location, that without adaptation, we generally expect crop yields to decline as warming increases. Moreover, studies suggest that these climate trends are outpacing the capacity of farmers to adapt on their own. We see this in particular in semi-arid agricultural regions like the Brazilian Sertão, where local trends can be more than twice the global average, really just astounding changes in the last half century. This is a dairy and livestock region, and here we see that the trends have made it increasingly hard for small family farmers to grow enough forage for their animals. This has led to both overgrazing, like you see here in this farm in the middle, and expansion of crop and pasture land. Then this really does become a vicious cycle because the conversion of carbon-rich native habitats to farmland releases a lot of carbon into the atmosphere and is in fact the biggest source of emissions from food production. But it turns out that there are some very clever strategies for intensively producing new forage crops, like this palma foragera. You might recognize this as nopales, or cactus, from your local taqueria. Uh, it turns out that cows and smaller ruminants love, love this stuff just like the rest of us. You can produce a large volume in a small area, and thus you can rehabilitate an ecosystem, sequester carbon, and increase farmer productivity all at the same time. My students and I are working with a group called Adapta Sertao to measure the impacts for farmer incomes, food production, land cover, and climate of technical assistance programs that are helping farmers who want to adopt this system. The third way in which climate changes are impacting food production is through large increases in emissions and thus concentrations of compounds we typically consider air pollutants, things like surface ozone and its precursors, and particulate matter like black carbon and sulfate aerosols. These are potent climate change agents and also have negative impacts on humans and plants. If you look at a place like India as an example, and where crops are grown, these areas are actually often very polluted. This is an image from NASA of an atmospheric brown cloud, a regional scale pollutant cloud that builds up during the dry season. In India, this is the wheat growing season. And using emissions data, satellite measurements, and crop data, my UC San Diego colleague and mentor, Ramanathan, and I have shown that increases in pollution over the past three decades have been devastating to wheat yields. They're over 30% lower than they would have been had the air stayed relatively clean. On the one hand, this is an astonishingly large number. But the good news is that these pollutants have very short atmospheric lifetimes. Unlike long-lived greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, some of these compounds last only a few weeks in the air. 
so you would see an almost immediate impact of any mitigation efforts. So what might be done? Some of the pollution is from urban sources that wafts out over agricultural areas like you see here, but a lot of it is also from biomass burning in traditional cook stoves in the agricultural areas themselves. There is, in fact, a tremendous overlap worldwide between, between food and energy security. Many of the world's poorest agricultural households also rely primarily on biomass as their main source of cooking energy. They spend tremendous amounts of time gathering wood and dung and crop residues with obvious implications for land cover. Cookstove technologies that are both more fuel efficient and cleaner burning can address both pollution and deforestation. However, it turns out that many so-called improved cookstoves are actually not any better for people, crops, or climate than traditional stoves. Students in my lab are working both to measure the emissions from different types of cookstoves and to figure out ways to use carbon markets to incentivize the uptake of truly improved technologies. So to conclude my remarks tonight, I'd like to reiterate that I'm hopeful. It is easy to assume that food and climate are locked in a vicious cycle of feedback. But by thinking about the constraints that climate places on the world's most vulnerable farmers, namely seasonality, long-run trends, and pollution, it becomes clear that win-win scenarios do exist. It's an honor to be part of the community here at UC San Diego that is working to imagine, implement, and evaluate these kinds of solutions that show promise of putting us all on a more sustainable, food-secure future. Thank you.